God, our Father, our Maker, and our Creator, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our Comfort and Guide, the Holy Spirit, we give praise and thanks just for this opportunity, privilege, to be able to come again into the house of God, to be able to share His Holy Word as we <clears throat> continue to go through struggles and the difficulties and the ups and the downs and all the things that life throw after us, somehow or another God gives us the power and everything we need to be able to persevere. And certainly we give him praise and we give him thanks. We thank God for our brothers who comes each and every Sunday morning and just to support it to help us to do the things that we need to do continue to reach out to our communities and around and about to uh, continue to encourage people's uh, spirit in, in the Lord and to encourage and to instruct, to correct, and to just help us to all become better people and to encourage us to continue to examine ourselves and examine ourselves by the Word of God because one thing for certain, we, we want to be uh, in the will of God. We want to be in the will of God. We want to make sure that we are not running a race and at the end of the journey find that we have run that race in vain. So it is about us looking into God's holy word and looking in it as we look, look into a mirror. This, work, this mirror is the mirror that we might look at our souls, look at our spirits, look at who we are on the inside. I thought what the Word of God does for us in the Scriptures is all Scriptures are given by the inspiration of God. They are our Scriptures that God has inspired to be given to us. And certainly He gives us these Scriptures because He cares about our well-being and the outcome of our situation. So we give God praise, we thank Him, and we thank all the listeners, and we want to continue, continue to encourage each and every one that listens uh, to keep your faith in God, to hold on to God's unchanging hand, and just be faithful. The scripture said, be faithful unto death. God said, I will give you a crown of life. And that's what we are battling for. This is what we are looking forward to to when, when, when the story has been told, we would be able to receive the crown of life. I want to ask you to bow your head with me for just a moment for the petition of throne of grace. Father in heaven, we come again, Lord, and we, we come with thanksgiving in our hearts. We come, Heavenly Father, knowing that you are God and beside you there are no other. We come asking you, Father, to forgive us for all of our sins and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. We bow down, Heavenly Father, knowing that you know more about us than we know about our own selves. And Lord, you know more about what we need than we really know how to ask. We realize, Heavenly Father, that we can't even pray unless you give us a prayer. We realize, Heavenly Father, that we can't even change our lives unless you give us repentance. We realize, Heavenly Father, that all that we have belongs to you. Without you, Lord, we are nothing. We come to you, Heavenly Father, knowing, God, that our goodness is as filthy rags before you. Knowing, Heavenly Father, that we don't even have the worthiness to bow. And except we look at the cross. We understand, Heavenly Father, that the work that was done on the cross is the only thing that gives us permission to even bow down and come into your presence. Oh, Lord God, we understand our position. We see where we are. And we know, Father, that we are nothing without you. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to strengthen us where we are weak. And we ask you to build us up, Lord, where we have been torn down. And, and God, prop us on every knee inside. We ask your Father to see us, Lord, as we are, and help us to see ourselves as we are. And 
wherever we are broken, Heavenly Father, we pray, God, that you would fix us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would look upon those who are sick and those who are shed in, those who are locked behind prison walls and those who don't know you in the pardon of their sins. We pray, Heavenly Father, for every home and every, every family, God, that, that our prayer may be able to reach out to. We pray, Heavenly Father, for all those who, 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 who are lonely, Lord, and, and they don't know which way to turn, don't know which way to go. We, we pray for those, Heavenly Father, who are trying to do good but just don't know how to do good. We pray for every church that opened their doors in your name and everyone who called themselves under your name. Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray today that we would do the things that is consistent, the things that is accepted, the things that is good in your sight. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just bless us with the blessing that you see that we stand in the need of. Oh, God, we just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would lead and guide and direct us in the way that you would have us to go. Pray, Father, that you would help us to be what you want us to be. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would be able to suppress the old man, that the, that the inner man might be able to rise up and take charge in our lives, that it might be that spirit man that instructs us, that that spirit man that follows you, Heavenly Father, that we would follow that spirit man, God, that we might be able to do the things that are pleasing, the thing that is acceptable in your sight. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are praying for those, Lord, that, that are in so much pain and those, Heavenly Father, that don't even feel the character that they need to live any longer. Oh, Father, I just pray, God, that you would touch them and strengthen them. Help them, Lord, to find their place, to find their place in you. And help them to find their peace, Lord, and, and help them to find their comfort. Oh, Heavenly Father, we realize that the devil has attacked your people and continue to attack every day. No, Heavenly Father, but Lord, you said that you come, that we might have life, that we might have it more abundantly. So, Lord, we come and we lean in and dependent upon you. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to bless us this day. Help us to do and to be. Say the things, God, you would have us to say. And do the things, Lord, that you would have us to do. We pray, Heavenly Father, that this today would be a success in your sight. Whether or not be a failure or success in our own sight, but that it would be a success in your sight, Lord. Because that maybe someone would hear some word, something that might be said. It might encourage their spirit that may turn their lives around. Or that might restore them, Heavenly Father, where they have been broken. We ask you, Father, to go with us and stand by us, Lord Jesus, and please stand for us. We claim victory in the name of Jesus. Count it as already done. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Praise be to God. God is so worthy to be praised. Amen. We want to say and remind people that the door of the church is open. And Jesus Christ has said, whosoever will, let him come, that the Lord has made salvation available to, to all of us. This is what the works of the cross was all about. It was about paying a debt that was owed, a sin debt that was owed, that no man was able to pay. So God sent his only begotten son and taking on the form of a man taking a man's position, the body of a man, the mind of a man, uh, the mentality of a man, but yet and still also being the Son of God. But he had to feel what we could feel and understand things that we understand as we go through different things. The Lord come and took that position to identify with us so that he could become that sacrifice. He could become that perfect man that it would take to be a perfect sacrifice to pay a debt that was owed to sin. Christ had paid that debt. He paid that debt and now he says to us, come unto me. He's calling us to come unto him because what he, what he wants us to understand and realize that we are failures by nature. 
that we are born under Adam and Adam has failed and when we operate according to that earthly nature we fail we fail and there's nothing we can do about it and when I think about the children of Israel the first thing they needed was deliverance because until you get deliverance from sin there's no further that you can go so when we said that the door of the church is open what's being offered is deliverance God wants to deliver you. God wants to deliver you. Because one thing for certain, this old life don't last always. We want to remind our listeners that uh, if you want to listen to these messages that you can go to TLR Films at YouTube. TLR Film at YouTube. Or if you need just to have a conversation. A lot of times people just don't know where they stand. And I, and I look around and I think about in this world how the devil has suppressed us. He, he has dug a hole in his birds. And he makes people ashamed to come forward and acknowledge their shortcomings and their failures. And all the time God is speaking and saying you need to talk to somebody. And, People are losing their mind because they don't know which way to turn. And God has help. And that's what you need to know, that God has help. God has people who are willing to sit down and talk with you and to be able to help you to see your way through. Because, you see, nobody makes it through this thing by himself. We all need help. Every one of us need help. And we need help maybe in, in, in different things, but we all need help. God has made help available, and there is people who don't mind helping. And certainly, I don't mind helping. I don't mind having that conversation, being able to encourage you in the Lord. You can call me at 731-234-1849. 731-234-1849. As we look at our scripture, we're going to move on. I think the message today is a crucial message and it's the one that I think that is so important that we get and understand the message about how important uh, our salvation is and being born again and necessary, something that is necessary. <clears throat> from the John, from St. John the third chapter beginning at the first verse, he said there was a man of the Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night, said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, but no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I'm going to say that again. Except, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Born of the water, which testify, water baptism, it is, it, it is a witness on earth. Born of the Spirit, which is the Spirit of God, which is a witness in heaven. It's the water that bears record on earth, but it's the Spirit of God that bears record in heaven. But we have been born again, and God knows who belongs to Him. God knows His children. Sometimes we make the statement, we're all the children of God. Yes, we're all the children of God in creation. But we have to be born of the Spirit to become part of the family of God. Because the Scripture talks about 
adoption process that, that God put into place to bring us back to himself. And it was through the sacrificial offering of Christ our Lord that that adoption program was put into place. I want to talk about uh, how it is that looks sometimes can be deceiving. Looks can be deceiving because it's necessary to be born again. As I was looking at scriptures and I'm praying, and I find that God sent me in a total different direction that I was thinking on. How it is that sometimes when you are trying to prepare to speak the word of God, that it seems like you ran, run right straight into a brick wall and there's nowhere to go. And I thought about how it is that I read scriptures that tells us that we have to persevere in prayer. That it makes no difference how much you have prayed and how faithful you have prayed. That sometimes prayer is something that you have to fight with. It's like the Jericho wall. That sometimes there is a back pressure, there is a pushback that sets out to hinder your prayer because if there is no breakthrough in prayer, then there is no breakthrough in the word. So we have to be able to sometimes just pray our way through. We have to resist our own flesh. We have to resist sometimes the environment that is around us. We have to resist uh, the, 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 uh, the different noises, the different voices, the different sound. We have to fight against all of those things because we're trying to get somewhere. We're trying to get somewhere. We're trying to get to God. We're trying to hear God. Because we know there is a world that is lost. There is a message that needs to be shared. There is hope that needs to be offered. People need to know where they stand. People need to know that there are help. People need to have a mirror held up in them. People need to see that their disposition, whether they are in the right position, whether they are in the wrong position. So we have to fight to come to that place. Help. We have to fight to be a help. Help to ourselves and to help to our brothers and our help to our sisters. As I was looking at these scriptures, I looked in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel, 16th chapter and 6th uh, and the 7th verse. And how it was that one day when God was ready to make a change, he was ready to change Saul from the kingdom. He was ready to place David into the kingdom. And he sent Samuel to Jesse's house to anoint him a king. And as Samuel goes to Jesse's house and he is prepared to do what God had told him to do. When he, and as one of the sons come by, Samuel looks at him and he says, Surely the anointing of God stands before him. God says to Samuel, look not upon the height of neither the countenance of him. For God don't see as man sees. For man will look on the outward appearance. But God looks at the heart. The idea is that God do not measure a man by what he looks like. He don't measure a man by his bank account. He don't measure a man by his family or by his prestige or by his status in the world. He measures a man by his heart. And here is something else. God don't even measure a man by his religion. Have you ever wondered why it is that God gives us so many stories, peoples who fail in religion? fail. When I think about and I look at the scriptures and the things that we are taught and I think about so many messages that I hear. And sometimes when you think about them it will actually break your heart 
to think that how it is so often time prosperity and wealth financial independence is being preached over the kingdom of God and when I thought about this I looked at the scripture where it gives us the story of a young rich ruler the young rich ruler comes to the Lord one day and he says to him good master what good things must I do to be saved? And they go through the whole process of the law. And the young man says, oh, I have kept these things from my youth up. And I thought about how it is. It seems that many of the messages that has been preached, this young man fit the, pro he fit the profile perfectly. He had become wealthy, financially independent. He was a religious man, and it seemed that he was dedicated to a religious belief, and he worked all of these things to the best of his ability. But when Christ examined him, he found he fell short of what God's expectation was for him. How it is that he had settled for a position. You see, he had settled for a position that prepared him for living here. But he had not prepared himself or he had not accepted the life that God had prepared for him. A life of eternity. He had not accepted that life. He had built his own life. A life that he loved. A life that he enjoyed. Not that God has any problem with anyone having financial security. But God has a problem with anyone exalted their wealth and their world, these worldly goods above him. For thou shalt have no other God before me. He was a wealthy man. He was a religious man. But when he met Christ, he just simply was not prepared to give up the life that he built. It is a story of so many of us we are not prepared to give up the life that we have built. And so many of us, it has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with a dollar or cent. We've built our lives upon our own ideas, our own thoughts, our own ambitions, and our own more. And we are not willing to give it up when God calls upon us. When I look at these scriptures, I look at so many stories, so many stories that talks about Men be in religion, but yet when they are challenged by God, when they are challenged by the master, they continue to fail. I thought about the story of the ten virgins. The scriptures said five of them were wise and, and five of them were foolish. And I thought about how it was. The scriptures said they all went out to meet the bridegroom. It seemed that they had so much in common. They all are going out, and they are going out for the same purpose. They all are going out, and they all are believers because they believe that the bridegroom is coming. It seems that when you think about them, there's no doubt. If you looked at them, you could not tell one from the other. They all went out, and they all waited. It seems that they're all on one accord. They all waited for the bridegroom. But the scripture said that they, 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 they all slept and slumbered. Every one of them went to sleep. Every one of them was tired. And they all was waiting. But the difference was that the wise, when they slept, they slept with all in their lap. But the foolish, they had no all. And I thought about the difference it makes. How it is that sometimes we can look just alike. We may even have a twin. Sometimes we can have the same jobs. Go through so many of the same experiences. Enjoy the same things. But when it comes down to whether or not we have prepared ourselves to meet the Lord, it's a different. When it comes down to whether or not we allow the Holy Spirit 
to dictate and rule our lives. It's a different. You see, the wise had an escort, but the foolish didn't. For the scripture lets us know that we all have to have an escort to come into the kingdom of God. Because it's the Holy Spirit that ushers us in to God's kingdom. I thought about the rich man and Lazarus. And when you read the story of the rich man and Lazarus, it's clear that the rich man is a very religious man. But yet, when it's all said and done, he has no compassion in his heart. Thought about how it is, how important it is to have compassion. A great man is not measured by his bank account, measured by his compassion, measured by his love, his measures by whether or not he has accepted Christ into his heart. And the scripture lets us know that as they lived, the rich man seemed to have it all. He seemed to have wealth. He seemed to have friends. He still seemed to have all the things that we want in the world. But he don't have compassion. He don't have love for his, his fellow man. He has a man at his gate every day. But he can't see it. Oh yes, he can physically see it. But he can't see his pain. He can't see his suffering. He can't see his need. Not to the point that he's willing to do something. But yet he is a religious man. Ain't it interesting how it is that peoples and scriptures seem to be so religious, but yet and still they fail? When we get these stories that God gives us, stories like the man's that couldn't come to the banquet because one says, I, I've murdered a wife, another says, I've bought oxes, and another says, I have bought land. I know I'm invited. I know I need to be there. I know I need to put aside the things that I, that's important to me because the master is calling but today I pray that you would just have me to be skewed. And how many times we use so many excuses to not do the things of God. The scripture says our days is numbered and our boundaries are set and we can't pass it. That lets me know that we all have an expiration date. There's a limited amount of time that all of us gets to live. And somehow or another, we sort of seem like it would get the other guy, but it would over skip me. It would skip right over me. And I will have time. I will have an opportunity. And I will have everything I need. I'll be ready when it comes, when the time comes. But the scripture said, not every man that says, Lord, Lord, would even enter into the kingdom. But he that do the will of my father. And we sometimes we want to half do our job. Half walk for God. Half do the thing that we promised the Lord that we would do. We find ourselves settled in religion and not in a relationship. It's a critical thing. It is a critical thing to be born again. It is a critical thing to be saved because I'm afraid there are many, many people who have their name on the church road that have not been born again. Born again is a necessity. I'm afraid that so many of us have settled in religion because it shows up in our action. It shows up in our conversation. Whenever you see a man that is a Christian that cannot honor God in his conversation, you must be born again. You must be born again. As we look at these scriptures, I thought about also a man that the Lord gives us a story of. A man who went to a wedding but didn't have on a wedding going. The scriptures seem to continue to give us all these stories of men 
who are simply not prepared. And this is what God wants us to know. That heaven is a prepared place. Jesus said in my father's house is many mentioned. But what revelation and look at the king, look at the great city. And it tells you how beautiful everything is laid out. Even the streets are paved with gold. It is talking about a place that has been prepared for God's people. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. How crucial is it that we be the church that God, Christ, have died for? It is very crucial. It is crucial because for one thing, the scripture said we shall share the inheritance with him. God is calling us to share in an inheritance with his son to share in an inheritance to be able to sit on thrones and be able to admit, be administrators in the kingdom of God. God is preparing us for another job. Oh my God. He is preparing us for another job. Don't you see in the scriptures where the man that was able to take five talents and build five more, how it was that God gave him more because he was faithful to what he gave him. The man that had ten was able to multiply and God even gave him more work to do. He gave him another job. He gave him a greater responsibility. He gave him a greater honor. Why? Because he was faithful over that which God has given him. The scripture said that we shall reign with him. I don't know what you think about but heaven is a place where God has laid out work for you to do. But not the kind of work that we have down here where we toil every day, where we labor and where we suffer and where we can't find peace in our labor. But he has fixed us to be in a position to where we share in an inheritance, an inheritance with Christ. That inheritance, the scripture said, is a place where God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. An inheritance where there is no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness, and no more death. An inheritance where the former things are passed away and all things become new. But as the Lord talked to Nicodemus, he shared with him this information. In order to become a part of the inheritance, you must be born again. The peoples in the community, the peoples in the town, the people that knew Nicodemus felt like he was one of the straightest men in the world. He has God got his masters in the religious matters. But yet Nicodemus was not saved because he had no knowledge of a new birth. How, how crucial it is to be born again. We bet our lives on it. And I would encourage all of us to examine our relationship with God because I just mentioned a few stories. Mm -hmm. But if you look in the scripture, you find story after story where men were religions. They was dedicated to their belief. They fought for their belief. But they wasn't saved. It was the lit religious crew who worked so hard to get Christ to the cross. You see, religion don't necessarily make you true. As I looked at the scriptures, the scriptures said that they toiled all night with Jesus, that they tr tried him all night. They they went through so much effort to come up with some charges, to try to create charges to, to make them stick against him. That the morning they delivered him to Pilate. And they didn't really deliver him to Pilate for Pilate to try him. They delivered him to Pilate for Pilate to kill him. Because they had took a vote. And they had voted against truth. When I look around in the world today, I see many peoples today who have took a vote and they have voted 
against the truth. And I'm going to tell you if, you, if you live for God, then they have voted against you. Jesus said if they do it to a green tree, what do you think they would do to a dryad? Nicodemus wanted to know how could a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said that which is born of flesh is flesh. That's a word right there. Because it lets us know that a loss of thing that you deal with in this life, you're not going to overcome. A loss of time you get sick, you're not going to get well. If you lose a leg or an arm, you may not be able to get another one. A loss of thing that happens in this fleshly life, it is flesh. And though the outward man perish, the scriptures of the inward man is renewed day by day. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And the scripture said that God shall give us another body, like an until our own glorious body. I don't know what that do about you, but that gets me excited. It gets me excited to know this Christian life, this journey that I'm on, that I'm not already chose to be on a winning side. I chose the truth. I chose to trust it, and I chose to follow it. I'm not saying I do it perfect. Sometimes I fall flat on my face, and sometimes I go before God with shamefacedness because I failed him and I let him down, but yet and still, I'm still holding on to the truth. I know he is right, and I know he has already won the victory. I know the side that I'm on, the death do not control the side that I'm on. I've been born again. I've been saved, washed in the blood of Christ, and I give God praise. This is all that we're trying to say. Example yourself to look at yourself again and be sure. The songwriter said, be sure that your anchor is holding on to a solid rock. Mm -hmm. God bless you. May he keep you. Amen. Amen.